Great. Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming. This is um, I'm excited to be here and, and talk about history. I love history. Um, I don't get the chance to do as much history as I want, so what I do, I'm excited about. So um, this is a project I've been working on for quite a few years um, related to the, the history of early American roentgenology. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of different uh, papers that form the basis of this presentation. Um, one has just come out, another one is coming out a little bit later. Um, but but, but you'll, you'll sort of see where I'm going with this and, and why I'm interested in this and the, and the title to this matter. So, so this is a picture of Walter James Dodd. All right, Walter James Dodd was a physician and a roentgenologist, and I'm going to butcher that pronunciation, okay, because I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pronounce Röntgen the way it should be pronounced, okay, so we're just going to say the American pronunciation Röntgen, all right? So he was a physician and a roentgenologist at Mass General. That's his picture. Um, that picture appears in, in, a, in, a, in his biography, which was written by John Macy. You can see Dodd lived from 1869 to 1916, uh, and according to his friend, uh, and, uh, who was also his colleague at Massachusetts General, Charles Allen Porter, who's a surgeon, he endured 32 surgeries between July 10, 1897, and March 1, 1909. The details of some of these surgeries are actually quite gruesome. Um, and I won't re replay all, all of them, but uh, the surgeries were almost all done on his, starting with his digits, his fingers, and then they moved up to his hands, uh, and then eventually they even moved up to his arms. He died in 1916 from radiation-induced cancer, and the instrumentality of his suffering was the x-ray, because he was a roentgenologist. And so, you know, the real question is, why did he do what he did? And not just why did he endure 32 surgeries, but again, some of the details of this were quite gruesome. He would get into battles with his friend, uh, Charles Allen Porter, because Porter would want to do amputations uh, at, at, a, at a quick enough speed because they did have pathology and, you know, about the, the fin de siècle at the turn of the century, and they could tell that some of the lesions that were forming on Dodd's fingers and hands were cancerous. They could tell that some of them were carcinomas. And so Dodd did not want to have his fingers amputated, so instead of having one surgery, he would have five surgeries. And he would have five surgeries because each one of these surgeries he would have Porter remove as little of the actual tissue as he could, right? In fact, the, we have documentation that Dodd would actually leave raw nerve endings exposed in his fingers. Um, uh, why did he do this, right? I mean, that's really the question. Why would he do this? Why would anyone do this? Uh, and, and the answer is pretty clear. We don't have personal papers from Dodd. That's one of the difficulties of doing this kind of research is we don't have a lot of personal testimony from any of the roentgenologists who I'm going to be talking about today. So it's sort of left to the historian who's interested in these topics to, to sort of put together a partial, I think, but nevertheless historically plausible account of why Dodd did what he did. Uh, but it's pretty clear from what Porter says. It's pretty clear from uh, John Macy, who's Dodd's biographer, and it's pretty clear from another man named Percy Brown, we'll talk about Percy Brown in a minute, that Dodd did this because he wanted to preserve as much use in his hands as possible. Uh, that's not that strange, but specifically he wanted to preserve as much use in his hands as possible so that he could continue to, continue to manipulate the controls on the x-ray machines. And so he's willing to leave raw nerve endings and his fingers exposed so he could do this. Um, so we want to sort of understand why this is happening. Percy Brown, Percy Brown wrote a book in 1936, okay, and this book documented the martyrs of science. That's the title of the book. Percy Brown was a roentgenologist. He was one of the principals of the American Roentgen Ray Society. He knew Dodd. He knew many of these other roentgenologists personally. But the key is that Dodd's behavior is not isolated. Okay, between 1895 and 1950, 1915, between 100 to 200 American roentgenologists, roentgenologists died of radiation-induced cancer. Right? So, not all of them, obviously, but what I'd call a statistically significant number. Furthermore, when we get into the details of what happened to these people, again, we don't have personal testimony, so we don't know exactly what they were experiencing, but it, it seems likely that some, at least some of them suffered before they died, right? They had these open sores, these suppurations, which would turn into ulcers, and then these ulcers would become, eventually over repeated ex exposures, not only scalded, they would become cancerous, and the cancer would start to spread. And so then they would have to excise the skin, and then they would have to be doing amputations. And the amputations would go up the arm as the x-rays, as the x-ray exposures um, proceeded into the axillary glands. And then eventually, once the cancers would metastasize to their cardiothoracic cavity, they would uh, uh, eventually die. And so um, the real question is, is why did they do this? We have you know, details, for example, from Macy's biography, which indicates that there were times when Dodd would come home and his wife would find him hemorrhaging. 
basically. Uh, we don't, again, have evidence of what Dodd was doing, but, but we do have some, interestingly, some correspondence between Dodd and some of his colleagues at Massachusetts General. And so we know when we line up the, the roster of surgeries that Porter indicates, and then we line that up with some of the letters that he exchanged with his colleagues, and these are not personal letters, these are professional letters. Um, we know, for example, that within 60 days of having a fairly serious amputation, he was hard at work again with x-rays. And in fact, he, he composed a letter to one of his colleagues named Maurice Howe Richardson at Massachusetts General requesting the opportunity to take another series of x-ray plates on a patient whom this man Richardson had referred to Dodd. So the real question is, why did they do this? That's what I sort of got interested in this, is what's going on, why did they do this? Um, the most obvious answer, and it's the one that Percy Brown likes, um, is that they lacked awareness. They really didn't understand what was going on, and hence, that's where their martyrdom comes from. That's what Percy Brown says. You know, these gentlemen gave their lives, and actually women in some cases, um, they gave their lives for the, the pursuit of this science uh, unknowingly. And that only when they realized what was going on, once we understood that they could be shielded and that we could, you know, add lead suits and things like that, um, you know, did, 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 these, did these kinds of incidences, incidents cease. Um, the problem is that this is not true, generally. Right? There is very, very, very good evidence that undermines this view from very soon after January 1896. Just to give you guys a, a timeline, a chronology of what's going on here, um, news of Ronchin's discovery started uh, early November, November 3rd, uh, 1895 is when it started. Uh, in fact, we're at the, uh, I think they marked the 125th or anniversary or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, 125th anniversary of November of 2010 was actually in the paper. So November 3rd, 1895, um, experiments started almost immediately after. And this is something that's very important to understand about x-rays is they could be very easily fabricated. Unlike most of the other technologies that were starting to be used in the hospitals and in American healthcare, anybody could make an x-ray machine. It really was not very difficult. A hobbyist, a photographer, wasn't very difficult at all. And so you have a proliferation of x-ray machines in photographic studios. And even though this particular talk focuses on the physicians and the rotinologists themselves, most of the people who were using x-rays were not physicians and rotinologists. They were office workers. They were x-ray te technicians who were not uh, doctors. They weren't nurses, although nurses did. Uh, and they were also um, they were lay people. Uh, there were lawyers who were doing it all the time. Okay, so we know that these things were very proliferating very quickly. Experiments started going on very soon. Uh, and we also have pretty good evidence that the people who started to experiment with x-rays knew pretty quickly that these things were dangerous, right? Uh, and so if that's the case, I'm going to go ahead and document some of that. But if that's the case, then we're still left with the question of why did Dodd and his ilk undergo this kind of thing? Why did they do this? What was the reason they did it? So. This is just some examples of some of the primary sources that we have. And you can see there's a, an academic publication that's starting in March 1896. That's mere months after Ronchin's discovery is released. Incidentally, as far as I can tell, nobody can find this paper. Uh, we might have to rely on an Italian historian to find this one. Um, but then there's a, uh, a well-known Boston dermatologist named J.C. White, uh, who's uh, also in about the middle of 1896. Um, an SJR is reporting from London in the middle of 1896. David Walsh, in, late, in about a year after x-rays were discovered, uh, he's reporting on dermatitis caused by x-rays. This next one is actually pretty significant, Morton and Hammer. The x-ray or photography of the invisible. That's actually an important phrase. We'll come back to that. Photography of the invisible. But it's important to just sort of keep that in mind. That, this is a book and it was published in 1896. And we're going to talk about Morton and Hammer. There's even x-ray injuries being done to patients, right? I mean, the New York Times reports on this in 1897. Miss Josie McDonald, um, she was actually burned by the x-ray at her dentist. Uh, the next day they covered an editorial. Uh, one day wasn't enough coverage for the time, so they went back to it and published an editorial. Uh, she initiated a lawsuit, by the way. They talk about that as well. And then look at those last two, right? Edison on cancer. Yes, that is Thomas Edison, right? And Thomas Edison's actually an important part of the story. And you can see he's hinting to surgeons about cancer. And the subject of this 1901 article is x-rays and cancer, right? And this is 1901. This is just a few short years after these things happen. And don't forget the chronology. Dodd is continuing to work with x-rays and undergoing amputations well after 1901, to all the way up to 1909. Right? And, and the reason Edison is important is a couple of reasons. The first is by 1901, Edison is pretty famous right, in his own right. In fact, when x-rays came out, when news of them came out, no less an authority than William Randolph Hearst begged Thomas Edison to undertake to make a cathodograph, which is one of the words that they would use to describe x-rays, of the head. And Edison complied, and reporters flocked to his laboratory. Uh, the reason Edison became interested in links between x-rays and cancer is because the first documented x-ray worker to die of cancer was in the employ of Thomas Edison. 
in his laboratory, actually. It was a glass blower by the name of Clarence Daly. And the story is the same as what happened to some of these other roentgenologists and the x-ray workers as well. Uh, Daly was not a roentgenologist, but he started getting the scalding, the exposures on his fingers. Uh, then they formed cancerous lesions. They started to progress. They started to amputate uh, parts of his arm. It spread to his axillary glands in his chest, and he died of cancer in uh, 1904, actually, I think, or 1903. Uh, incidentally, his brother, Clarence Daly's brother, was also in the employ of Thomas Edison. He also had his arm amputated as a result of x-rays to exposures. So Edison has an interest in this in 1901. Uh, in 1903, two years later, Edison proposes a theory of phagocytic destruction. In other words, a pathophysiologic mechanism by which x-rays destroy, destroy tissue and uh, uh, induce cancer. Uh, and there's an editorial that's written and it's published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which was pretty prominent even by 1903. Okay? And this editorial is actually worth looking at in, in pretty close detail because it tells us something about the, the, the idea that they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know that this was dangerous. So I want you guys, when we look at the text of this, to consider not just the content of it, but also the tone. Look at the rhetoric, right? I mean, rhetoricians talk about res and verba, right? Res being the subject itself and, and verba being the language that's used, and they're both pretty important to conveying the message. So think about what they're saying here. At this somewhat late day, Mr. Edison, and through him the newspapers, have all of a sudden discovered that x-rays can cause injuries. And like many other belated discoveries, the topic is now one of lively interest in the daily press. He has as far as can be judged by the newspaper reports, found nothing that has not been found before, and offered no explanation that is of any value. He is rehashing in the daily press facts that had been learned by physicians seven years ago. Okay? So if we just do the chronology, 1903 minus 7 takes us to 1896. Right? This is when really x-ray experiments started in earnest in the first quarter of 1896 in the United States. Right? And so Again, we want to think about the content of this, right? I mean, they're basically saying, look, there's nothing that's very interesting here. We know all this, and we've known all this for a very long time, right? We've known that x-rays are dangerous. We've known that x-rays can probably induce cancer. Uh, there's really nothing here that's very interesting, uh, Mr. Edison. Thank you, but go away, OK? Uh, now, now, that's what they're saying. That's what looks like the substance of it. But note that the significance of this editorial is not a function of its correspondence with reality, right? And what I mean by that is, let's say that this is not true. We think that it is true, but that's the hypothesis. We don't know. So let's say that this is not true. Um, this is still a highly significant editorial because the authors of this editorial, and it was unsigned, by the way, right? the authors of this editorial are prepared to publicly call out Thomas Edison in a very prominent medical journal right, on the issue of the danger of x-rays. Right? So even if it's not the case that they knew that these things could induce cancer, uh, the fact that they're willing to call out Thomas Edison in the pages of this journal and use this kind of language suggests that, that, that they don't really think that there's much of significance here. Right? And, and that, that it was important enough to them to say this that, that they wanted to take this tone. And that's pretty significant, right? So uh, fortunately, uh, this is not the only evidence we have. We have a lot of evidence, right? And so uh, this is a gruesome picture. I thought I'd wake you guys up. Uh, a, a little bit into my lecture, right? So, so these are the hands of Miran Krikor Kasabian. Miran Krikor Kasabian is an Armenian-born early American roentgenologist. He's actually a very important early American roentgenologist. He was responsible for a number of papers and articles, as well as two of the most important early textbooks on x-rays. He was uh, prominent in the American Roentgen Ray Society, which um, instituted in, I think, I think 1900 or 1901, I think was when his first meeting was, okay? Um, this photograph was taken in 1908. You can see from his lifespan that he died in 1910 at the age of 40. He did die from radiation-induced cancer, right? So, Kasabian, did he know what was going on? Did he know, right? Well, he published an article in 1900 in the American X-ray Journal entitled X-ray is Irritant. Three years after publishing this article where he talks about the dangers of X-rays to human tissues, he accepts a position in the Ronchin Ray Lab in Philadelphia. Right? So he knows these things are dangerous because he publishes an article about it. And then right, he accepts a position which will ensure that he continues to be exposed to these x-rays. Right? Um, the second edition of his textbook was posthumously published in 1910. Well, maybe did they not know that lead shields would protect? No, that doesn't work. Okay, We've got a lot of good articles talking about uh, the protection from x-rays that occur when you shield people. These come from 1901, 1902, 1903. There's a lot of these articles. Um, in fact, one of them is published by a man named Charles Lester Leonard. He basically says, I have never seen any case of x-ray burns where they're shielding. And that's a 1901 article. And oh, by the way, Charles Lester Leonard also died of radiation-induced cancer. Okay. Uh, and in fact, as historian Rebecca Herzig notes, um, his pain, 
right, as the amputations and the ulcerations and the open wounds increased, seemed merely to have <coughs> intensified his fascination with the x-ray. And that's a pattern that we see with these rontgenologists over and over and over again. They're continuing to work with x-rays even as they continue to be burned and scalded and they have separating wounds and amputations and repeated surgeries. And, and, and to say, as some people have sort of implied, that they knew of the risk of burns but not cancer, I think requires a pretty large stretch. I mean, these are physicians and rontgenologists, right? I mean, the state of the art in 1900 is obviously not what it is today with regard to cancer, but they were not ignorant of cancer, right? They had pathology. They could tell that certain carcinomas were formed, and in fact, they knew about these things. And we know of that from a lot of other evidence. We also know of that because that's what Charles Allen Porter, the surgeon, was telling his colleague, Dodd, who's the guy who started, he says, listen, you have cancer. We must amputate your fingers now, is basically what he said. Right? So we, we, we have to, to say that they knew of the risk of burns but not the life-threatening risks of cancer requires, I think, a pretty large suspension of, of, of disbelief. Right? We have to say that they could see the burns, they could see these wounds, they could see them become ulcerated, they could see that they were becoming cancerous, they could see it spreading, they could suffer these amputations, but in the end they didn't actually know that this was cancerous and it was going to pose a risk to their life as they continued to expose themselves to the very, instrumenta the very instrumentality of their harm. Uh, I do not think that this is very likely. Okay, We can't rule it out in the absence of personal testimony from the rontgenologists themselves, but that does not strike me as very likely. Um, most people who have looked at this at all have said that um, by 1903, at the absolute latest, they definitely knew of the risk of cancer of these things. Um, I think the, that's probably a little bit too parsimonious of a chronological assessment. I think we can probably impute awareness of the risks of cancer to the rontgenologists probably as early as 1901. There's a couple things that come out that, that tell us that um, an influential rontgenologist named William Rollins has a paper entitled X Light Kills. That was the title of the paper, right? Light, light, which we'll talk about more, light is a very important metaphor that people use to describe X rays. And everybody used the word light. Rontgen, in early November, he described it to the newspapers himself as the light that never was, which I think is actually an important phrase. We'll talk more about light, okay? So, um, Rollins refers to this paper, he basically irradiated a guinea pig, and, and literally a guinea pig in this case, not a human guinea pig, right? He irradiated a guinea pig and it died, and he also noted that it died after 11 days of being subjected to x-rays for two hours a day without showing any burns, interestingly enough, okay? So I think they knew. Uh, I think that we can't say they didn't know about the risk of cancer. So, so then why, right? Uh, and that's sort of where my work sort of picks up, trying to supply a historically plausible account of why they did what they did. Um, this is not a complete account. It's not intended as a complete account at all, again, because we just don't have testimony from the rotinologists themselves in too many cases. So my, my thesis for this is that partly what explains why these people were willing to suffer and die for what they did is the power of the visible pathology, the power of the visible pathology in mid to late 19th century American culture. Um, we're going to start out by talking about the power of the visible in medical and scientific culture and then extrapolate a little bit to the power of the visible in larger Western culture because I think those are both pretty important. Um, when I say the power of the visible material pathology, what do I mean by that? Well, I think most people in this room probably know that medicine, allopathic medicine, started to change pretty fundamentally in the 19th century. Um, and, and why did it change? How did it change? Right? To explain what's going on with x-rays, I think we have to understand this change a little bit more. Um, and, and the power of this change really turns on the significance of anatomy. That's what really starts to happen in the 19th century. Uh, and it's not that anatomy was discovered in the 19th century. right? They were interested in anatomy in the Hippocratic corpus. right? We weren't the first ones to get interested in this. Galen is interested in anatomy. We've always been interested in anatomy. Uh, but the difference is that anatomy as a focus of rank and file physicians was not something that was part of medical practice for a very long time. There's always people who've been interested in anatomy, always physicians who've been interested in anatomy. But in the 19th century, anatomy came to define the profession of allopathic medicine, and that is something distinctive. That is different, okay? Uh, in fact, Robert Martinson, who is a physician and a historian, and he's the director of history at NIH, he actually goes so far as to say that its reliance on anatomy is Western medicine's most distinctive knowledge-making characteristic, right? So the idea of anatomical knowledge is at the center of what it means to practice allopathic medicine in the West. This is what Martinson says. And there's a lot of evidence we have for this. Martinson argues it, but we have a lot of other evidence too. In about 1800, uh, in Foucault's nice phrase, and I'm not going to beat you over the head with Foucault, I promise, okay? But in, the, in, in about 1800, the clinic is born. 
That's what Foucault says. And really when we talk about the clinic and these changes, there's two parts to it. The first is a focus on pathological anatomy, right? So we look at inside the body. We open up the body, we look inside, and we find these gross, these, these discrete material pathologies, okay, these lesions, if you will. Uh, and, and then we are able to correlate. There's two parts to it. It's not just finding the material pathologies. We have to be able to correlate these gross material pathologies with the illness complaints that the patient had while they were alive. Now, why do I say while they were alive? Right? If we're practicing anatomy, we have pathological anatomy on them, what does that mean? Yeah, they were dead. Okay, they were dead, right? This is pathological anatomy. That is obvious, but also important. It's important because we'll come back to that with x-rays. Because suddenly with x-rays, we can start to take pictures of the living body. That's new, okay? So in any case, this change focuses on these two things. It's focus on pathological anatomy, these gross material lesions, and clinical correlation, being able to mark that with symptoms of disease. This is what Foucault calls the clinical gaze. But I've just uh, told you that this is a big change. And so what's the change? Right? Say, say something about the change, we have to understand what came before it. And what came before it is humoralism, right? humoral medical cosmologies. Right? So I'm also not going to beat you over the head with humoralism, I promise. But we do have to understand just a few things about it because it puts into relief some of the changes that are going on in the mid to late 19th century. So humoral, humoralism, for those of you who don't know, was the dominant understanding of health, illness, and the body, with obvious variations, for about 1,700 years. Okay? It started in Galen, and it didn't really give up its hold until the 19th century. And in fact, there are some historians, and I would count myself among them, who think that it hasn't given up at all. Okay? And, and actually, one way you might think about that as an uh, from an intellectual historical perspective is, look, this is, these are ideas and rubrics and frameworks that dominated Western culture for 1,700 years. It's probably a little bit of hubris to think that they're going to completely vanish. Right, from the fabric of Western civilization in a couple centuries. Right? So uh, it's not the subject of this talk, but if you're interested in that, one of the most obvious examples that I and some other people talk about is the chemical imbalance theory of depression. Right? You guys heard about this? Well, the idea of that is that depression is caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters in the brain. Right? The problem with this is that we have almost no evidence that suggests this is the case. We have a surfeit of evidence that actually suggests this is not the case. Right? And yet this idea persists. It's very prominent in pharmaceutical marketing. And it's, it's an imbalance of humors, as far as I'm concerned. It's an imbalance of chemicals in the brain. I mean, that sounds like humoralism, as far as I'm concerned. Right? So without going too far into humoralism, how is humoralism different from what comes in the 19th century, even if it's still with us in some ways? Right? Humoralism focuses on flows. It focuses on the four humors. These four humors, an imbalance in humors is what causes disease. The humors are the two biles, black bile, yellow bile, uh, phlegm, and blood. Okay? Uh, and so they're focused on the channels. They're focused on which way these flows are going. They're not focused on discrete tissues. They're not focused on solid entities. It doesn't mean they didn't know about tissues. Of course they knew about tissues. It doesn't mean they didn't know about cancer. They absolutely knew about cancer. It just wasn't what they focused on. That was not what was prominent. What caused disease in humoral medical cosmologies? You name it. Right? Humoral medical causation, disease causation, was understood as this convergence of what they would call predisposing and exciting causes. Right? So you had to have things that would predispose somebody to develop illness. And what might those be? Well, where shall we start the list? Okay? Those could be temperance. Do you drink or not? Squalor. What are your living conditions like? Family. Right? Who is your family? Do you have children? Are you married? Do you have siblings? Right? What social class are you? Right? Do you whore a lot? Right? Do you live near water? Right? What kind of air do you have? What's the topography like? What's the climate? Does it rain? And on 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 and on. Okay? And so then these things would combine with certain exciting causes to produce illness. Right? And the idea is that there's myriad permutations. In fact, some historians who look at this say you could pretty much assess any cause of pretty much anything that you want under a humoral medical cosmology, which is actually part of its advantage. It was very flexible right? and it helped people understand what was going on in their lives. Right? The point of all this is, let's say you are an 18th century healer, right? and you are trying to help your patient. Uh, they have an illness. They have an illness complaint. You have to understand that patient completely. You have to know everything about what phenomenologists refer to as their life world. What was their life like? Right? You have to know about their social lives, their family. Did they drink a lot? Right? What were their sexual habits like? Right? Did they have access to clean water? What kind of living conditions did they have? Who was their family? What was their social status? You have to know all of these things to be able to treat the patient effectively in an 18th century context. Right? In addition, in the 18th century context, 17th century context as well, probably, we have a relative unity between mind, body, emotion, cognition, suffering, and illness. That's not to say that they wouldn't recognize distinctions between these concepts. They probably would, but not to the extent that we would today. 
and there's pretty good evidence for that in patient narratives that we have from particularly from 18th century accounts. The point of all this is for my purposes, for thinking about x-rays, the lesions are simply not paramount. They did not focus on discrete solid tissues. This is a big change. This is a big change in the 19th century, okay? And so I like the way Foucault puts it, and I, this is the last Foucault, I promise, okay? Um, what I think is interesting about Foucault is Foucault, um, a lot of people love Foucault, but I think actually his, probably his most important book, at least the one that I think is most important for this stuff, is actually not talked about as much as a lot of his other books. Um, the, the book is called The Birth of the Clinic, and the subtitle of this book is the subtitle of the slide, An Archaeology of Medical Perception. I think that's actually a very important phrase because what Foucault is trying to do is to unearth, to excavate a new way of seeing the body, a new way of seeing health and illness, right? Uh, it, it's very visible, something very important about that. And, and the way he puts it, I think if you really, um, uh, you know, everything you always wanted to know about changes in 19th century medicine, here it is. Here's your sound bite. Someone asks you. This is what, uh, this is, uh, if we had a learning assessment of this, this is what you would get out of it, I think, this talk, right? He says, the appearance of the clinic as a historical fact must be identified with the system of these reorganizations. This new structure is indicated by the minute but decisive change whereby the question, what is the matter with you? with which the 18th century dialogue between doctor and patient began was replaced by that other question, where does it hurt? In which we recognize the operation of the clinic and the principle of its entire discourse. If you want to summarize the changes that I'm talking about, they're certainly not the only changes, but the changes that I am most interested in here between the 18th century humoral cosmologies and 19th century anatomical cosmologies, that's the difference. What is the matter with you to where does it hurt? We want to find the discrete pathology that we can correlate with your illness. Okay? Problem is, though, is a lot of people who talk about this, well, this is not a problem, but a lot of people who write about this, they're really focused on changes in the culture of science and medicine. Okay? And I think that this is um, not a problem, because it's certainly accurate and reasonable to do so, but there are larger changes afoot. There are larger social, intellectual, political, cultural, economic changes during the 19th century in which it's important to understand what's going on with science and medicine, because these larger contexts have significance for x-rays. They have significance for understanding why Charles Dodd would do what he did. Okay? And the 19th century is, of course, a, a, an a time of enormous change. Right? We have industrialization. We have urbanization. What was primarily an agrarian economy in many important ways, at least in the West, was fundamentally starting to change to an industrial one. Right? Huge upheavals. And one of the most important things that happens, at least from an intellectual perspective, is we have changing conceptions of objectivity. Now, most people in this room use the word objectivity a lot, is what I would guess, and we have a pretty understood, felt sense of what that means, uh, but we have a very important uh, legacy left to us, or legacy, it's an ongoing thing, by historians of objectivity, uh, and this is one of the books that came out on this most recently, that suggests that objectivity was not just a concept that was handed down to us in its current form. It didn't just start meaning what it does today, okay? It has a history, and in fact, there are different forms of objectivity. Right? And so what we mean when we say, well, I'm looking for objective data is not what they would have meant when they, when they used the term objective or whatever the, the, the cognate of that would have been in the 17th century. Without going into a lot of really gruesome detail on this change, what happens in the middle decades of the 19th century is a focus on mechanical objectivity. What is mechanical objectivity? It focuses on an attempt to represent nature just as it appears. I want the evidence to speak for itself. When I take a photograph of the inside of this dead person's body. Okay? I want the photograph to represent exactly what I see as much as I can, and I want to eliminate my subjective influence in the evidence that I'm creating as much as is humanly possible. Okay? In very important respects, we still use this concept of mechanical objectivity. Right? That's what we say. Well, is it subjective or is it objective? Does it depend on what you think, or is it just the truth of the way things are? Right? And this is what's happening in the 19th century when we focus on pathological anatomy. The inside of the human body and the pathologies that they were locating and finding and correlating become sites of truth. Truth with a capital T. Okay? And so the emphasis on epistemology, on truth conditions, is very important. And it started to become the, the truth of the body. The body would reveal the truth. It would speak for itself if only we could convey these images. It was the mechanisms by which these things happen that matters. Okay? This probably doesn't sound that strange to most of us sitting here, but the problem is that this is not what they would have understood in the early modern era. Right? In fact, in the early modern era, the idea that we would try to convey exactly what we find just as we find it would have been alien. 
That's not what they were trying to do at all. If you go back into the history of medicine collection and you look at some of the botanicals, okay, um, they were not trying to represent the exact flower that was in front of them. That's not what they were trying to do. In fact, they were trying to create a perfect archetype, the ideal representation of what this flower looked like, of what this exotic bird looked like, right? of what this herb looked like. That's what they were trying to do. The idea that it, they wanted to convey it in all of its imperfections, just as they found it, would have been very strange to early modern scientists. Right? So what does this have to do with x-rays? And part of the idea is, again, we've already talked about it, right? this focus on the body itself, the images of the inner body, these pathologies, these natural objects as being sites of truth in and of themselves. Okay, is a fundamental change, and it's one that's much larger than science and medicine. It's one that we see in science and medicine, but it's much larger than science and medicine. We have very good evidence that it's one that the lay public participated in as well. Right? Last point is this book is written by Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison, who are two leading historians of science. And I want to say for my purposes, I do not think it's an accident that they trace the history of objectivity largely by looking at changes in scientific atlases. So they're looking at pictures. Right? They're looking at pictures, and they're looking at pictures of the body, as well as other kinds of natural objects. And they're looking at these things over 400 years, and I don't think that this is an accident. Okay? So to sort of sweep back around and get back to our story of Dodd and why he did what he did, okay? we have to understand the significance of looking into the human body, of being able to remotely anatomize the human body in light of these larger contexts in which the very concept of truth and knowledge was beginning to be associated with representing these natural objects just as they appeared. This is just an enormously powerful thing, um, and it's powerful enough to transform a lot of key things in Western culture, um, not by itself, but with other things, and it's also powerful enough to play a role in transforming medicine and science in the 19th century. And so take a look at this. This is Morton and Hammer's book, right, published in 1896, so again, very early. Very early after X-ray's experimentation starts. Uh, and this is called X-ray, the photography of the invisible. Now we can start to see the significance of photography of the invisible, bringing to light what could not be seen before. Right? If that gives us a privileged account of the truth, it becomes extremely significant. Extremely significant, right? Ronchin's referring to them as the light that never was. Morton and Hammer say, there are some discoveries of a purely scientific nature that appeal only to a limited class while others broadly affect the life and happiness of the human race and thus become of universal importance. Right? And so we can say, yeah, there's probably some hyperbole in their rhetoric. I mean, they're trying to sell a book. right? But on the other hand, in light of the context we've just discussed, the idea that there was something absolutely critical going on with x-rays and that people who were involved with it sensed it um, is, is important, it is significant, and it probably lends some substance to this beyond hyperbole. Right? So, so here we go, remotely anatomizing the living body, the sort of subject of this talk. Right? So here is a little bit further in this book. I don't know if you guys can read that, but I'll read it for you. Um, this is again Morton and Hammer. And now comes Professor Ronchin, the importance of whose discovery largely consists in the interest he has excited throughout the world and the marvelous impulse he has given to ex experimentation on both sides of the Atlantic. While Leonard, who was a prior, prior scientist, had led his cathode ray outside the bulb, blah, 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 blah. Leonard this, OK? Yet, when Ronchin produced similar effects at comparatively enormous distances. Right, there you go, there's remotely. Right, so think about the significance of this. Looking inside the human body, finding gross pathologies, material discrete pathologies, being able to correlate them with illness. If I'm right in suggesting that this was a matter of tremendous social, cultural, intellectual, and professional importance, then being able to stand on the other side of the room and doing it right, would, was bound to be just unbelievable, just astonishing. Okay? Right? In fact, it was. So similar effects at comparatively enormous distances from the tube, and to the extent of depicting the, the bones within the living flesh, the world's amazement knew no, knew no bounds. And there we go. Remotely anatomizing the living body, okay? Being able to look inside the body and see these pathologies that we could correlate with illness from the other side of the room while the patient was still alive without relying on the butchery of the anatomists. And the butchery is a term they would use, okay? I'm not actually castigating the anatomists. That's often how they refer to as butchers, right? Um, Sometimes politely and sometimes less politely, OK? Um, so, so this is extraordinary. And in fact, you look at the next sentence. Morton and Hammer are aware of this. They say, he, he being Ronchin, transformed what had been merely an interesting scientific fact into a positive power for good, which will affect the entire human race.
okay? And so this is the significance, I think, remotely anatomizing the living body. This, I want to say, is part of the reason why 100 to 200 bone genealogists were willing to, I think at least some of them, suffered probably pretty gruesomely and die. And part of it was because of the social, cultural, intellectual, professional power that was garnered by remotely anatomizing the living body. Okay? Uh, it really embodied these nascent sort of cultures and discourses of science and medicine and larger dis discourses as well that were going on in Western, Western cultures. Right? So they struggled for language. You can tell. I mean, they're using hyperbole, but the, the people who were talking about x-rays struggled for language that was adequate to describe what they were experiencing. Right? And, and, and Rebecca Herzig talks about this. She has a nice little, I think, a pithy little, little sentence. She says, invisible, there's that word again, active at a distance, and powerful beyond any received understanding, the uncanny x-ray invited religious comparison. Right? They struggled to find language that was adequate to capture the significance of what they felt they were doing and seeing. And so they had to turn to these powerful metaphors. So one we've already seen, they talked a lot about light. Right? And light, of course, has religious connotations. Right? I mean, bell, book, and candle, the medieval ceremony by which people were excommunicated from the Catholic Church, right? that's putting out a candle. Okay? So, so light has enormous religious connotations. Um, and um, this is sort of the last part of, of what I'll be doing, I promise. Okay? Um, I, I think the idea that, uh, of the religious language is actually very important. Okay? I think it, it hints at something that's going on here. Uh, and and I, I've had an interest in this. I don't do a lot of work in religious studies or really any work, but I'm interested in it as an outsider, I guess. Uh, and I have this idea um, that medicine is similar to religion and that they are both adjustments to the tremendum. Now what in God's name does that mean? Okay, well the idea of adjustment to the tremendum is a very important uh, concept uh, in religious studies. It comes from the really renowned religious studies scholar Erwin Goodenow. I actually know his grandson by the way, so that's quite fun. Um, who's a law professor by the way. But Erwin Goodenow says that religion, why do, why do people practice religion? Why, do people, why are so many people religious? And Goodenow said part of the reason is it's a way of adjusting to the tremendum. The tremendum is the beyond, the unknown. Okay, some people might call it the afterlife, but it's not necessarily the afterlife. It's just what's out there beyond ourselves we don't know, okay? And, and there's this sort of existential terror, and so religion is a way in which we adjust to the tremendum, okay? And so partly what I've argued is that I think that there is something similar about medicine. Right? Because in both cases we have a supplicant, someone who needs help. They seek an intercessory, right? a priest, a shaman, a healer medicine man, a medicine woman, whoever it is, okay, and there is a body of arcane knowledge that the supplicant, in this case we're talking about the sick, per sick person, right, cannot access, right? I don't know if there's medical students in the room, but if there are, you know that you are acquiring and assimilating this body of knowledge to which lay people generally do not have access, okay? And so the healer possesses this arcane knowledge and is able to access this arcane knowledge on behalf of the supplicant, okay? And there are tools. There are tools that the healer uses. There are tools that the, uh, the religious figure, the shaman, will often use. These tools are sacraments. They are ways of communing with this body of arcane knowledge, whether it's the spirit world or whether it's Grey's Anatomy okay, or the PDR or something like that. These tools are iconic. We have icons, and they are iconic. That's the whole point. We have the black bag. We have the stethoscope. We have the white coat. We have the microscope. We have many others. Okay? We also have the operating table. And for those of you who are interested in this, there is a wonderful, wonderful paper that was written by a man named Daniel Hall, who's a practicing surgeon and a priest, an ordained priest, who has a paper uh, comparing the ritualistic aspects of what he does as a physician, as a surgeon, to the ritualistic aspects of what he does as an ordained priest. And he specifically talks about the operating table as the altar, because they're both consecrated. They're both cleaned, they're both set apart, right? And we both, we get closer to the truth of the inner body on each of them. This is what Halt says, okay? And so part of the thing I argue is that x-rays are another one of these sacraments. They are a very powerful tool with which we can access this arcane knowledge of the living body, the living conscious body even, which we probably don't do as much of in surgery, right? Uh, Hall, Daniel Hall has this very nice quote. I think this very nice quote where he says, and he's absolutely right about this, that for generations, medical anthropologists have observed across cultures that the roles of shaman, priest, and medicine man are frequently filled by the same individual. Okay? And Hall says this is no mere coincidence. Right? And I think he's absolutely right. So um, uh, Dr. Savitt was kind enough to mention it. Um, I, I've had a couple of different phases of this research. This is the next one. I'm actually presenting on this in about six weeks. I am not going to go into it because 
think you guys have had enough. <laughs> um, but basically, what I'm really starting to look at also is another way of thinking about the power of remotely anatomizing the human body. Okay, and litigation, as well known by people who study this, is an important window for what's going on in society at any different time. Okay, what we're litigating about, what's important in the context of the litigation, tells us something about what's going on in a particular community who's doing the litigating. So I'm looking at cases involving X-rays, right? And some of this I've already done, and some of this I'm still doing. Um, cases involving x-rays and figuring out whether they can tell us anything important about what's going on. And I think they can. The cases start very early. They start in 1899. They're probably earlier than that. That's the first published case that I can find. We find claims for x-ray burns. We find what I think are actually more important attempts to use x-rays as evidence. And there you go. That is the first, as far as I can tell, that is a picture of the first x-ray that was ever attempted to be introduced into evidence by an injured plaintiff against their physician. Okay? And this this x-ray was attempted to be introduced in Denver, Colorado in late 1896. Late 1896. No, late 1895. It was right after x-rays were discovered, within a month, December 1895. Uh, and it was a very, very important case. I'm not going to talk much about it here, but this is the subject of my paper that I'm presenting in about six weeks. Um, and my argument is that x-rays were powerful enough to completely, um, to, to catalyze changes in the American law of evidence. Law of evidence is a pretty conservative institution, right? And so x-rays, I argue, were by themselves sufficient to catalyze these enormous changes that are still with us today. Uh, they catalyzed them. They didn't create it by itself. I'm not arguing that without x-rays this wouldn't have happened, but it happened a lot faster because of x-rays. So that's the next part of this, sort of another chapter, another way of describing the significance of x-rays and the power of them at the time. Um, so I'm going to leave uh, the references up. This is just a sample of some of the references that I used. Um, and I'd love to hear any questions, comments, or concerns you all have. Ask questions. You have to use the microphone. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Also very scary, uh, if if what you argue is correct. So how did these people who used X-rays? How did they did they think about their patients? Did they care if their patients were harmed? Were they just so interested in seeing live anatomy that? that they forgot all this? That's a really good question, Angie. Um, the answer is, is, is yes, right, to both, unfortunately, right? Uh, um, we have pretty good evidence. Um, and in fact, one of the, the articles I cited, I mean, it's early. It's 1897, right, um, of, a, of a, a woman who was injured by being irradiated, right, at her the dentist's office. We have uh, pretty early, there, there was a very large judgment that was awarded against a very prominent rheumatologist in Vienna. And for those of you who know anything about Fond du Siècle medicine, anything that's going on in Vienna is more important than pretty much anything that's going on in the United States in the world of Western medicine at that point. Okay, So this was a, a, a director of rheumatology at a prominent Vienna hospital, and he was successfully sued. And, and was, there was quite a large judgment that was issued against him. And this is within the first five years. Um, so, so, so yes. And no. We also have evidence that there were lots of, of, of rheumatologists and x-ray technicians who, who were much more careful, much more scrupulous. Um, they didn't shield them as much, I think, although there's some evidence that some of them shielded. But it was more about limiting the, 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 the time in which they were exposed. Right Early on in x-ray usage, um, it was not uncommon for people to be exposed to x-rays for two hours at a time or more. Right? Uh, and so more often than not, when you have patients themselves, the, there, there is an effort to keep those exposure times to 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour um, at, a mo at most, as opposed to two and three hours. Right? Part of that also depended on the skill of the technician. Right? They weren't all physicians and rheumatologists, but some people were better at using the x-rays and manipulating the controls and getting the images that they wanted quicker than other people were. And so that had something to do with it as well. Um, but the answer is both. I mean, both. There were a lot of people who were injured by x-rays. Unfortunately, the other thing we know is that there were a lot of people who, um, and I don't talk at all about this, but there was a very important culture of vitalism going on in American medicine at this time, this focus on vital energy in which electricity and electromagnetism played a very important part. And so electricity was actually seen as therapeutic. And in fact, some of the earliest papers on x-rays were published in electrical engineer and electrical journals. And so you can guess that, I mean, I don't, I don't have them up there, but you cannot open a page of a medical journal talking about x-rays in this time without finding next to all the patent medicine ads, ads for using x-rays as therapeutics. X-rays could cure this. X-rays could cure that. It didn't matter what it, what it was. If you had it, x-rays could cure it. Right? And so this was also a problem, people being exposed to x-rays as a therapeutic as opposed to just a diagnostic. Um, I don't think the rheumatologists, not a lot of the rheumatologists really believed that 
after a few years. I don't think they thought, they, 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 they might have been curious about it, but I don't think they saw it as a cure-all or anything like that. Other questions? When did it become common, and then I assume it required, that uh, people use the lead aprons and things like that? And I'm certain over time they became less clumsy and, and easier to use, but um, it, it started, it really didn't start until sort of the late 10s, into the 1910s and after that. What you really start to happen is, you know, the, the physicians and the neurochronologists are getting very irritated, okay? And the reason they're getting very irritated is because photographers are using x-rays and taking plates of people, right? And they do not like this at all. They did not like that what they saw as their technology or technology that was primarily for their usage and natural scientists' usage was being appropriated by photographers and office workers and things like that. So they tried to get control of it, and they succeeded in getting control of it eventually. Uh, and x-rays slowly began to move out of the portrait studios, out of people's private homes, out of offices, and into hospitals and clinics and places where they could have x-ray workers and a bit more of a controlled environment. As that starts to happen, you know, they start to get, as they get more control over the apparatus themselves, they're able to get more control over the kinds of, of requirements that they have for people to be able to use them. And so shields and lead suits started to become much more common into the late 10s, um, and certainly by the time we get to the late you know, 1917, 18, 19, 20, they would start to become pretty common by that point. My parents were born in 1922 and 1927, and they both remember going to the shoe store and have, as children, and having an x-ray taken of their foot to show that there was uh, space for their, feet, their toes to grow within the shoes. So this, I assume, was, would have been in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, maybe the middle to, to, to later 30s. So, in, so this, you're talking about in the, by the 10s or at least by 20 that it's common for them to be shielded, whereas this was in, this was in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. We're not talking out in the boondocks here. We're talking a large city in probably the mid-late 30s. Right, I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, the sort of part of the question is, right, the, the, the age old cliche is what did they know and when did they know it, right? So first we have to ask who, who knew it and what did they know, right? By the 1930s, if you are, I mean, they weren't even called rheumatologists really by the 1930s. They were called radiologists by that point, okay? And if you're a radiologist in the 1930s and you do not know that x rays are dangerous and can cause cancer in the US, I think you're in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. Um, I think it's probably pretty likely that most people did, but I'm not sure. Right? But, but still, you know, we have the fascination with the technology, right? the proliferation of it outside hospitals. And, and once it, it sort of launches that substantial foothold outside of hospitals and clinics, outside that control, um, it can be tough to dislodge. It actually doesn't surprise me. I mean, I, I'd be curious to know how common that was, but that doesn't surprise me. It was very common. Very common. When I was a kid, <coughs> excuse me, in the 40s and early 50s, we had, and I don't know if anybody else is. Well, you're all too young, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, we had, um, it was a great treat to go to the shoe store and look at your feet um, and see if your shoes fit. There's an article about this really, by some Canadian uh, uh, historians of medicine. Right, and they actually, this was going on in Canada, by the way. I know there is one article in particular that I know about from Canada. But actually, I think this is particularly interesting because, you know, I think it's dangerous to take an instrumentalist view of history. I mean, I think history is worth studying in its own right. But history is also important because it tells us something about what we're doing today, right? And, and for those of us who know, we have a terrible problem with overutilization of medical imaging. Terrible problem. When I say overutilization, we know we use lots of medical in, in, imaging. And in a lot, of a lot of cases, we use it. And when we look for evidence of benefit, we don't find it. There are lots of, especially chronic conditions, which we do a lot of imaging for. One of them I do a lot of work on, which is pain, especially chronic low back pain, which we know, we absolutely know it does not benefit. And we've now started to find out there are significant risks from the background, the ionizing radiation. Right? I mean, there, there was a paper that came out in, I think, the Annals or, or Archives of Internal Medicine that calculated that, you know, in, that something like in the next 30 years, 29,000 people uh, will develop malignancies as a result, directly as a result of exposure to medical imaging. 29,000. Uh, so, so I think that this is interesting, is, is our interest in seeing inside the inner body of being able to see what's going on to objectify these things, I think is, 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 um, it is both historical and it's important for understanding it in its own time. I think it's actually also contemporary. So, last question, because it's uh, time to quit. 
So you started off by saying, why did these guys do this? And your answer is fervent passion. They felt that they were on a mission and that this is what they had, it was necessary to continue because they were doing something for humanity. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. I think, yes, it was definitely fervent passion, but what's the, what's the source of the passion, right? Was it just scientific investigation, the, the passion for science itself? I think that's part of it, right? I mean, Rebecca Herzig, she, 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 she writes a lot about the cult of self-sacrifice, and that's her word, not mine. The cult of self-sacrifice that existed at the time. And so that's pretty significant, I think, um, in explaining why they were so willing to do what they did. We see it in Aerosmith as well, which is just a few decades later, right? Um, but I think there's actually a more specific part of the passion that uh, I'm focusing on here. I think that's all true, and I think that Rebecca Herzig is absolutely right. But I think it's more than that. It's not just contributing to the scientific enterprise, right? I think it's being able to see inside the living body and to be able to see the pathologies that we could correlate with the complaints, to be able to say, this patient's coming in, they're complaining of pain in their leg, we do an x-ray of their, of their femur and we find the fracture. We see the fracture right in front of us and they're alive. I think that kind of thing is extraordinarily powerful, right? It's powerful intellectually. It's powerful professionally. Um, um, it's powerful socially, I think, as well. Um, even to lose fingers over, and surely not all of them. I mean, people weigh things differently. I mean, I'm not trying to sort of, this is not all rotinologists or all x-ray workers. There were a lot of people who decided it wasn't worth it. Worth it. There were a lot of people who used shields. I mean, that wasn't unusual, right, for people to use shields. But for these 100 to 200 people, it was worth it for them. It was worth it for them. They knew what was going on. They knew they were dying. They knew they were suffering. They knew why they were dying and why they were suffering. And I think that this, the power of the visible, is part of the explanation for why they did what they did. To add to this, I mean, we were talking about tropical diseases. You find uh, American physicians like Walter Reed and his team in the Caribbean actually exposing themselves purposely to uh, mosquitoes. And, and these diseases the mosquitoes carried could be very dangerous, if not deadly. And that's, that's part of the same thought and this was at the same period of time. That Absolutely. It's completely on. contemporaneous. And in fact that, that account that you're talking about, Angie, that's that's exactly what Herzig, Rebecca Herzig talks about in her book, Suffering for Science. She's talking about that exact dynamic you're describing at the exact time you're describing it. Um, I, I think Herzig is absolutely right. I, I think what I'm trying to do in this work is build on her work, offer sort of a complementary explanation that is situated in what she's talking about, but gets a little bit more specific as to what about this sacrifice was so compelling for these particular group, group this particular group of people.